So now, what are the main components and the main strategies Nengo is using for building up a brain model? So of course, we need a model of for, for, for neurons, for cortical neurons and subcortical uh, neurons. And what is very important, we need strategies and concepts how neurons uh, should be connected. That means we have to define neuron ensembles, neuron buffers, shorter memories, associative memories, and uh, uh, st neural structures which allow binding and unbinding. So that means at least we need to define strategies for coding higher level information called here items or concepts. And this is mathematically done in the Nengo approach by using S pointers. Yes, and last but not least, we will see how we can control neural processes over time by introducing a basal ganglia thalamus complex. And yeah, that's uh, mainly that what I would like to report concerning Nengo. Ah, yeah, I've forgotten to say, and last but not least, I will introduce our complete uh, speech production model, our large scale model, which introduces sensory input and introduces motor output. So at least we developed a complete avatar, including ears and speech articulators, which behaves uh, in specific ways if we define specific tasks, like in medical screenings for word repetition or comprehension tasks or serial recall tasks or whatever. So let's start with a single neuron. So the neuron, of course, is the uh, basic information processing unit in uh, neural models. We have presynaptic activity, which triggers postsynaptic activity in different ways. Uh, each neuron has its own way. So at least presynaptic activity triggers the activity level of each neuron. So the first thing I would like to show you is how a input value for example, a sensory intensity value can be represented by neural activity. And we will see we will need more than one neuron for doing that. So here we have an example, a Nango example for a leaky integrate and fire neuron. First of all, here we have an input over time. The input first is positive, then it goes to negative values and again to positive values and we see our neuron which tries to decode this input uh, or to represent this input by its activity over time uh, has a specific uh, sensitivity function because each neuron has a specific sensitivity function and this neuron here is especially sensitive for positive input. So we see in the time intervals here, the beginning and in the end, where we have positive input values, we get spikes. So how can we represent this input value? At least we need two neurons for doing that. One neuron which represents uh, a specific value range and a second uh, neuron which represents a specific value range here, the negative values, here the positive values. And we see, so now the spikes for these two neurons given here, the spikes are occurring for neuron one, which represents the positive uh, values here in this time intervals. And in this time interval, um, neuron two is spiking, representing the negative values. And now we see that the input function, the input value range is already represented over time here, quite good by two neurons. Of course, two neurons uh, are not enough because we see that um, the, the uh, neural noise is still quite high and the value is not represented very good. So at least using 50 neurons, as we see here, with specific uh, uh, sensitivity functions, we get the input value represented quite good. And here we see the neuron spike pattern, which, yes, at least represents the time variation of that or the variation of the input value over time for this, yeah, for this time interval given here. And that is the decoded 
resulting uh, output value. So, as in all approaches for neural models, we need a, a specific number of neurons here, 50 to 100 neurons, uh, in order to represent a value or a value range uh, in a um, yes, in a more or less good way. So and this is called neuron ensemble in Nango. So neuron ensembles can represent values. For example, muscle activation levels or sensory input intensity levels. So each value within a specific range is represented by a specific neural activity within the ensemble. And this can be decoded or encoded by uh, specific synaptic weights as shown here. So the value, which can be, uh, is represented here, um, is encoded, is represented by specific neuron activation patterns here and can be decoded or encoded by uh, synaptic weights, by neural connections. Going a step further, we can uh, put together 50 to 100 neuron ensembles, each representing a value to, to a neuron buffer. And here the semantic pointer architecture comes into play because a buffer now is able to represent complex information which we here call items. These items can be concepts or meanings or thoughts, or in case of our speech production and perception model, it can be phonetic or phonological units like syllables, phonological items, sounds or syllables, or it can be lexemes. So these items can be represented mathematically by S pointers in Nango, using the semantic pointer architecture and these mathematical s pointers which at least represent vectors of values can again be represented by neural activity now not just in a neuron ensemble but in a neuron buffer uh, which represents yeah a specific number of neuron ensembles At least what's going on in the brain is that each item activated in one uh, neuron buffer may be transformed or put forward to a next buffer and to a next buffer, and that is neural processing. And um, yes, the neural connections define how this uh, processing this forwarding is done specifically and we will come to this in the next slide ah first of all sorry I, i've forgotten to tell you so these neural connections are represented in uh, an angle by associative memories i will come to that later but first of all i would like to stay a little bit with the uh, neuron buffers uh, representing specific items so that's uh, uh, given here. The question is, if I have a specific neuron activity in one neuron buffer, how can I see what this neural activity is representing, which item it represents? So for this in Nango we use the so-called similarity plots. That means uh, this plot decodes the S-pointer activity for each neuron buffer over time. And that is uh, given here. That means the plot shows the most, the strongest activated item within a buffer for each moment. Yeah, and that is for example given here. We have four semantic pointers defined in our uh, uh, vector space here. And um, yeah, here these items, uh, dog, cat, bark, meow, are activated one after the other. Again, neural activity occurring here in the neuron buffer can be mathematically uh, 
is seen as a definition or as an activation of a vector in a d-dimensional space. D represents the number of neuron ensembles making up the specific Nango neuron buffer. And yeah, we see so different orientations in this d-dimensional space thus uh, represent different items and the length of the vector at least represents the activity with which an item is activated within a neuron buffer. As already mentioned, associative memories, which are neuron buffers themselves, um, model the transformation of from one of one item to a next item from one buffer to the next buffer. So, for example, associative memories are capable to define the associations for different items in different buffers. For example, a phonological form of a word can be defined in buffer A, that is this uh, transcription, that means it is more or less the acoustic structure of the word, for example, dog. Then in the next buffer, we can define the lexeme, dog. And in the next buffer, we can define the meaning of the word, which is more or less language, uh, an, uh, no longer language specific. So the associative memories define the neural connections between different neuron buffers, uh, yeah, between simple buffers just representing, representing neural states. So the um, neural connections, the link weights within the associative memories and uh, uh, within the connections between the buffers and the associative memory input and from the associative memory output to the next buffer input, that all is, of course, adjusted during learning. So link weight adjustments are done during learning. So neural associations, which are uh, labeled sometimes in these talks by this symbol, are at least uh, representing that what is given here. So each neuron of an input buffer is uh, connected with each neuron of the next buffer. But going back, it is a little bit more, there is a buffer in between in uh, the uh, uh, Nango framework. So the transformation of states uh, uh, from one buffer to another is done not just by uh, simple connections of each neuron with each other neuron, but in addition, an associative memory is uh, introduced between both buffers. Uh, more or less, the last point I would like to focus on in Nengo are S-pointer networks. So what we defined before here is just how we can associate items or S-pointers between different levels. So for, for example, between the phonological form level, the lexeme level, and the concept level. But something other is going on in neural networks. There are associations of items within one buffer. So items may be associated within one buffer. For example, at the concept level, dog and cat are associated with each other because both are animals. Share, the word share and table, or the meaning, share and table is associated because both are furnitures. Or at the phonological level, car and cat begin with K and thus are phonologically associated. In contrast to far and fat, which are as well associated with each other uh, because they are starting with an F. And the point is how this is modeled in Nengo on the mathematical level, that means on the S-point, on the vector level, is that similar items 
represented by S pointers, that the S pointers of these items, of similar items, point in a similar direction. So the directions concerning both uh, S pointers representing dog and cat are similar to each other, maybe here. Man and woman or table and chair are as well uh, similar to each other as it may be uh, is the case here. So this is as well pre-learned. That means that the, um, yeah, at least the mathematical definitions of these S-pointers are pre-set during learning, uh, yeah, before they are decoded as neural activation here in the Nango network. And please, again, keep in mind that this concept is different from this concept of associated as, uh, of associative memories. So this is one concept. The S-pointer networks is a different concept, working on one level, while the associative memories um, uh, represent associations between different uh, uh, buffers or different levels of the model. Yeah, and so now the time is there for, for introducing our speech processing, production and perception model, at least to introduce the architecture at this uh, point in time. So we have a complete large scale model and what we will see, we have on the one hand a perception pathway, the auditory input needs to be converted to cognition. That means understanding, comprehension needs to be done. And this is done just by giving some activity to one neuron buffer, to the next neuron buffer, and to the next neuron buffer, and so on. And in between there are associa uh, associative buffers, association buffers, uh, yeah, which uh, give a specific uh, transformation of items from this buffer to the next buffer, and so on. The same goes on on the production path where we start with a word with an s pointer or with a message and that is processed in, in, in neuron buffers as well and we, we are going down to the phonological level and further down to the articulatory acoustic output level in the same way we will see that in between this perception pathway and the production pathway we have we, we will have two um yeah, let's say knowledge or skill repositories, which are the mental lexicon and the mental syllabary. And they uh, uh, comprise the knowledge of S-pointer networks. Uh, that means how to activate specific um, neural activation patterns, in buffers based on specific S-pointer networks, which needs to be pre-learned. So going to the complete model, here we have the perception pathway, here the production pathway, and we see at least perception production pathway going through the periphery, then going to the perception side, going through the cognitive processing level, again going to the production pathway that forms a big loop. So let's concentrate on the perception pathway first. We have somatosensory input, auditory input and visual input. We will concentrate here on the auditory input, which uh, can be transformed from the acoustic signal to a phonological level, phonological level, then to a lemma level and then to a concept level. And the same holds for the production pathway from the concept level. We can go down via a lexical lemma level to the phonological level, then to a motor level, or then to, to, uh, towards a gesture level. I will come to that later on. So what we see in addition are that this big loop seems to have some shortcuts. There are some control mechanisms on the semantic level some control mechanisms on the phonological level and control me mechanisms for the articulation and the other way around here on the sensory motor level. And these things are called internal feedback loops. So first of all, we have the external feedback loop. That means that the motor or let's say the articulatory acoustic output is 
Yeah, if the feedback, I will go back to this. So it's if the feedback. So if we produce something, that means we move the articulatory organs and generate an acoustic output that can be controlled again here by the model. That is the feedback way. But we have some internal control passes, internal controls on the semantic level and on the phonological level. So th this really exists. Please believe me. So we can have, uh, we can produce an output and we can internally listen whether this output is produced correctly or we can internally try to understand on a semantic level whether this output is produced correctly. So that's more or least all concerning the model. What I did not discuss in detail, and I will do that now, is the control loop. That means we have to control all the neural processes. This is just an architecture. We have no information now how neural processes are sequenced with each other. This is done by the control module. And yes, at least we have just uh, discussed the input and output components more or less and not the cognitive processing component. I will do that a little bit as well now. So first of all, the, cont the cortical, cortical control loop controlling the neural processes that is mainly a model of the basal ganglia and thalamus. It controls the temporal sequence of the neural actions. How is that done in Nengo? So first of all, the cortex generates a list of potential actions which can be done by the model. And in each context, we can calculate a so-called utility value for each of these potential actions. Here we have three actions uh, given. And the most appropriate action, and this is already calculated at the beginning of this basal ganglia thalamus loop, um, the action which will be chosen is that with the highest utility value. That means that is the most appropriate action to be performed. And how the choosing process is done, the choosing is at least done at the thalamus, not, not shown here. How that is done in detail, that is modeled in Nengo, and I will not go into the details of this, by a very complex basal ganglia model. Here we have the neuron clusters of the basal ganglia, the specific um, yeah, pathways during the uh, basal ganglia. We have a direct and an indirect pathway, and we have exhibitory and inhibitory con uh, connections, so uh, different neuron models as well. And the clusters represent different parts of the basal ganglia, striatum, subthalamic, nucleus, globus, pallidus, and so on. And here again, last but not least, the more biological uh, view, the anatomic view, um, yeah, and I have to say we have different types of neurons of synaptic connections in different neuron clusters here of the basal ganglia. And at least the information goes towards the thalamus and back towards the cortex, what is given here by, by these lines. So at least information comes from the whole cortex in order to evaluate which action should be performed next. And then the action which is uh, calculated, this information is given back to the thalamus, uh, to, to the cortex again. Yes, that is not shown in the architecture here. This is just this control module. We have an, uh, an input activation in this control model. We have an output activation and this output uh, um, control activation specifies the action which is uh, done next and these black um, arrows at least indicate uh, the information processing but at least black arrows should go to each of these components here from here and black arrows should come from each of these components uh, here towards the control module so that is um, um, uh, simplified here in this uh, uh, figure for the architecture very strongly. So concerning the cognitive processing 
level, I just want to add some information that we can model short-term memories here. This is at least very simple. That are the same buffers as we use for item representation. But um, if we give them uh, neural within associations, that means if we um, realize this buffer uh, using recursive neural connections, then we have a short-term memory. We will not go into the details for that here. And some other process which is very important and which is very good incorporated in the Nango uh, framework is that uh, we have to model at least one very important cognitive process which is binding and unbinding, binding and inverse binding. For example, for building sentences like the dog barks, the cat meows, we have to bind dog and bark, cat and meow, or at least a little bit more complex on the sentence level, we have to bind dog as actor with bark as a verb to add this information. And then we can do unbinding processes by uh, activating inverse uh, pointers for this item acting, but I will not go into the details for these things. All this can be found very uh, easily if you go in the literature concerning Nango. Why did I reference to this? Because we need this si things of binding, for example, for memorized orderings in lists in the serial recall framework and for some other procedures. I will come to that later. So cognitive processing, or let's say on the neural level, binding and unbinding processes are realized relatively simply in the neuron fra uh, in, in the Nengo framework as well. We just need to implement binding buffers, which are a little bit more complex than normal item buffers. And these binding buffers, uh, yeah, we can hypothesize they exist in the brain as a specific architecture for doing bindings of two uh, pointers represented in two uh, item buffers and the binding result is given in a result uh, item buffer. So these architectures may exist in some places at the, uh, um, in the cortex and allow in a simple and very effective way to do binding and unbinding. Yes, uh, just to add this information, we need this uh, in one task, which is the comprehension task, where we try to activate superordinate items like a dog is an animal. So we try to activate the superordinate item animal if we hear the item dog and so on. And yes, and this is done by a binding process as well. I will show this uh, example later. Okay, I will stop here and in our next video we will come to scenarios because now we have introduced the basic ideas how uh, the, the, the basic ideas for the neural concepts in Nengo and we have um, given an idea how the architecture of a speech pro uh, processing model can look like and now what we have to do is how can we define um, simulations of these models. That means we need to define scenarios in which the model or the avatar, that means the brain model including ears and the speech organs acting like a subject, uh, uh, yeah, in which this, uh, we need to define scenarios in which these avatar can act. So thank you very much so far.